sounds like a good plan. Go for it. So uh, everyone, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, if you can, just uh, say hey in the chat and let us know where you're dialing in from and also what kind of business you're running. Just helps us to uh, kind of know a little bit about who we've got here with us today. Um, so as the title says, we're going to talk you through how to know if you can afford to hire. Um, so no matter what you and your team situation is right now, we're going to cover everything you need to know to kind of make the right decisions and feel good about those uh, decisions around kind of when to hire. Um, we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A later on, um, but please post any questions that you've got as you think of them in the chat and we'll come back to them uh, when we get to uh, towards the end. So a couple of points before we jump in. Um, it's going to be quite a relaxed session, kind of back and forth, almost kind of interview style between Rob and I. Um, no kind of death by PowerPoint. So if you're expecting that, apologies. Um, and there is a cheat sheet that we've got for you uh, that we will kind of give you a link to or we'll email it out to you uh, after, the, uh, after the session. Um, we do talk quickly. So uh, I've tried many times to slow down. Not very good at it. So I'm afraid you're just going to have to, uh, to listen fast. Um, but there is a recording that you can watch back afterwards and slow that down. And uh, crucially, you know, we may not have every answer uh, on the fly. We are both pretty good at what we do. Um, but, you know, some things we may need to kind of take away and check up on and then come back to you, which, of course, we will do. Um, and then finally, audience participation is crucial. It's way more fun for you, way more fun for us. So please, you know, jump in, ask questions and, um, you know, we'll kind of get stuck in from there. So some quick intros and then we'll uh, we'll get going. So, Rob, uh, tell, uh, tell everyone who yep. you are and what you do. Uh, so, hi, I'm Rob. Uh, I run Inside Matters. We are a, a financial reporting and analysis company and we work with agencies mainly to help them get value from their numbers. So essentially we do everything from bookkeeping to management reporting, KPI scorecards, and make sure that you as the owner uh, get all the financial information that you need that your corporate counterparts also have. No? Cool. Thanks, Rob. And hey to Jason and Ryan that have just joined us. Uh, we're just doing some quick intros and we're going to get stuck right in. So yeah, so I'm Noel Andrews. I'm the CEO and owner of JobRack and we help business owners hire really, really great team members from Eastern Europe. Uh, all kinds of business owners, all kinds of roles from developers, designers, project managers, uh, VAs, SEO people, anything you can think of, uh, we can, uh, that's kind of what we do. That's what we have. Um, so I'm just actually going to stop my screen share um, so you guys will get us a little bit live, uh, kind of larger on your screen. Hey, Danny, thanks very much for joining us tonight or today, depending where you are. Um, for those that have just joined, if you wouldn't mind just jump in the chat and just say, hey, let us know where you're joining us from. Um, and if you can, what kind of what uh, type of business are you running? And then we'll kind of tailor things as much as we can. Um, if you missed the kind of past kind of minute or so, we're just going to run a very relaxed session over the next kind of 15, 20 minutes or so. A little bit kind of interview style between Rob and I. Um, so no death by PowerPoint. And if you've got any questions at all, please just pop them into uh, the chat. And then we'll either cover them kind of if it makes sense as we go uh, or let a little later on, just uh, kind of about 15, 20 minutes or so. Cool. So let's jump in. So Rob, first question. Yes. Then. So when should we be thinking about hiring? Well, that's, that's a nice one to start with because that's the biggest misconception. Most people start thinking about hiring when they are maxed out, when their the quality of their service starts to crack a little bit. You know, delivery starts to um, uh, crack a little bit with deadlines being tighter, etc. Um, and in one of our clients' cases, even they were too busy to send out proposals to new leads that were waiting and uh, to sign. So that's the point where you really want to uh, start looking at hiring or expanding your team. But the best moment to for it is actually to do it a little bit earlier. Um, and that's when you still have the time and the capacity to invest a bit of time uh, in recruitment. So the time is when you want to do a little bit less yourself or um, when you see a jump in revenue coming. So not that it is there now, but when you see in two, three, four months out, we're going to make a big jump that's when is it's the best time to start thinking about uh, better resource planning. And ironically, one of the best indicators that you're about to run out of capacity is when your profit is getting too high. And I know that sounds weird because everybody wants a higher profit, but if your gross margin is too high, like higher than your usual standards, that probably means that your team, your billable team is maxing out so that is the first indicator or one of the first indicators that you want to be start looking at expanding the team to uh, lower the pressure and avoid any issues down the road. 
But when you decided that you need to hire, then the question becomes, what role should you be hiring for? Okay, cheers, Rob. Time for me to jump in then. So, yeah, you're thinking about kind of what role do you want to hire? And there's often lots of uh, kind of immediate roles that you jump to, right? You need to take things more off your plate. You need a virtual assistant, for instance, uh, or you need more delivery people. So, you, you know, whether you're an SEO agency or a web agency, you know, you kind of jump to kind of delivery people. But actually, you need to kind of slow down at this stage. And the first step is really to think about, you know, what's the outcome that you want? What are you actually driving for? So, you know, what are your goals? Is it that you're seeking to grow and you want more revenue? Do you want more customers? Uh, do you need to kind of streamline and simplify operations first before you get more customers and kind of maybe do more marketing? Um, do you want less work on your plate? And, you know, or do you need to kind of enhance kind of your product or service, actually make it better? And a lot of these things are kind of focused about doing more and growing your business. But it's not always about that. You know, sometimes it's about enabling you to do less. Um, we There's so many things out there that just say hustle harder, grow, 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 you know, make your business bigger, better, faster, whatever. But actually, there's a reason why we're all doing it. And while some of that is kind of financial and, you know, we all want a bit more money, potentially, actually, we've got to be a alive long enough to enjoy the money, but also actually enjoy spending it and do something with it. So a lot of the times, you know, people that come to uh, kind of work with both Rob and I, you know, are actually looking to do less um, themselves, you know, whether they're looking to kind of step in to be more kind of owner or investor level, um, but do less of the kind of day to day work themselves. So that's the first step is thinking about what is it that you really want and what are your goals? If it is growth that you're looking at for, then it's, you know, what's the barrier to that growth? You know, what's stopping you hitting those goals or being more successful? Or if it's actually more life focused, you know, what's stopping you having the life that you really want? Then the next thing is to be thinking, um, you know, what are the things that you need done? So you kind of got an idea of your goals, got an idea of what's stopping you getting to them or challenging you getting to them. So then it's like, what are the things that need to be done to really help you kind of, you know, break through and get there? And the first kind of danger people make is they often start thinking about a particular role. I always kind of counsel people, don't, don't worry about the role, don't worry, kind of pigeonhole, fixing it into a particular box or category or, you know, job title. Just think in terms of the stuff that you want them to do, the outcomes or the outputs. Sometimes you might need a hybrid, right? You might need a, you know, a virtual assistant that can also do graphic design, that can also do a bit of project management. You might need a developer that can also do some design and also be client facing. Uh, you might need a real kind of combination of roles and that's completely okay. The first thing is just thinking about, you know, what is it you need? And if you start with a job title, that can constrain you too much and kind of prevent you from figuring out what it is that you really kind of need and what's going to help you the most. Um, so, you know, thinking about your pain point, a lot of the time the people that, you know, you know, I kind of work with are looking to kind of free up their own time. And they immediately think, right, I need a virtual assistant because that's what everyone says that, you know, every business owner needs a virtual assistant. And I do agree that you do and they do. However, for me, that was actually my sixth hire. Uh, I've only hired relatively recent for my own personal assistant and it kind of, I've put it off for a long, long time. And that's because the things that were going to make the biggest difference were not getting rid of the things that kind of were on my plate. It was getting me more help to kind of grow and scale the business, get kind of delivery people and marketing people. So figuring out what your pain point is and what are the things that, you know, maybe you're not good enough, good enough at or not yours kind of skill set, you can't be good at everything. Um, and, you know, what's going to make the biggest difference? So if it's marketing and that's not a strong kind of strength of yours, then freeing up your time by getting rid of some admin isn't going to make a huge difference to the marketing, as an example. Um, and again, you know, often the role that we think we need to hire isn't actually the right one. Uh, and that's, you know, by talking to other business owners, whether it's mastermind uh, members, people in communities that you're with, people like you know myself or Rob or anyone at all, bouncing these kind of ideas around and just being challenged on it can really help you kind of to figure uh, kind of figure this out up front because what you don't want to be is one of the people that gets all the way through the hiring process right through interviews at this stage you've spent probably 40 50 hours or so kind of uh, you know through the recruitment process you don't want to get to that stage and then go ah hang on a minute no what I need is actually different because you've just wasted a huge amount of time and probably a significant amount of money um, and your time is hugely valuable so it's best to do this up front so thinking about what are your goals What's the barrier that kind of stopping you kind of getting to uh, where you want to be? And what's the specific things you need doing? And then from there, you can figure out, you know, what is the role that uh, you should be hiring next? 
So then the next natural question from that is kind of you're starting to get an idea of what you want uh, to be done. How do you know how much you can afford to pay? Rob, over to you. Before I jump in that, mm. a second story on what you just mentioned. I've been through that cycle more than once myself of starting with a job title, starting a recruitment, and then only after you hire the person, realize that that was not actually the biggest pain point or the biggest deliverable that we were looking to solve. So I can't stress enough how important it is to do that beforehand. We're currently trying to recruit somebody. We have changed the job description five times, uh, changed the job title four times, all in, 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 in the process to prevent that from happening. Yeah, um, definitely. If we're talking about how much you can afford to pay, First of all, the question is, can you afford to hire? That's the first question. The second is, how much can you afford to pay in terms of salary? But in the first question, how, can you even afford to hire? The first, there are a couple of things you want to look at for sure. And that is, of course, your revenue. If you don't understand your last um, quarter or last six months revenue, then that's the first thing you need to do. And that is not only understanding like, hey, it was this amount, you need to understand where does it come from? What's the trend behind it? If you're actually in a very seasonal business and you just finished your seasonal peak, maybe you don't have the need to hire now. On the other hand, if you're in a seasonal business and you are just before the peak, you kind of want to look at your team occupancy now and see maybe this is already the time to hire so that you can deliver on the peak that's coming. Second of all is gross margin. And this is incredibly important to look at this on the company level, but also on a per team level or on a service level, depending on how your business is organized. Um, and for just in case you don't know, gross margin is the, the revenue minus the direct cost of delivering your service. So that's all your billable people, basically. If your gross margin is too low, probably you don't want to be hiring for a billable role because either your pricing is off or your, your occupancy, so the, the, the efficiency of your team is too low, but there's probably a different problem than hiring would solve. Third one to look at is your net margins. So your overall profitability for the whole company. And here as well, you want to see that on a per team and a per service level as well. And the, one of the big reasons that I would want to see that on a per team level is overall the company may be reasonably profitable and you may think we should hire. But if you look at a team level, you would see which team is actually making the money, which team is actually not delivering money. So if you want to be hiring for the team that's actually not profitable, again, maybe hiring is not the solution. Well, if you are only looking at the overall profitability, so ignoring the teams, you may be missing out on a team that is above, uh, beyond capacity and having a massive gross margin, which kind of indicates that they're out of capacity. The other thing you want to look at is your, your cash flow reports. And if you don't have that, knock on your bookkeeper's door tonight, uh, today, because you really need that. That would tell you if you're actually generating cash in the business. And as a rule of thumb, and there's a lot of exceptions here, but as a rule of thumb, if you're not cash flow positive, hiring for billable roles is probably not the right thing to do. But there's a lot of company specific nuances there to see what is actually the cause. You as the owner, maybe with external help, maybe with, with your accountants, uh, would have to look at that. But if you don't have the information, you definitely can't see that information. Then those are all backward looking. The other two things that you would preferably also have is a sales forecast or a work forecast. What is the workload that you expect to have in the next three, six, 12 months? And does that indeed mean uh, that you need to hire for a billable role? Or does that mean you may need to expand on the non-billable side, on the overhead side? And if you really want to max it out, you also have a cash flow forecast. That will give you the most clear insight in can you afford to hire or not? Because that cash flow forecast will show you six months out, 12 months out, what is your cash position? How is your business running? And 
is it sustainable, financially sustainable to hire? Then if you're looking for a billable role, so somebody in your team who's actually going to do client work, there the biggest thing you want to know is how is the load factor of your team? And we, as a rule of thumb, work with ideally it should be between 70 or 85% of the time being billable. If it's much more than that, probably your team is too close to the edge. You don't have capacity for, for urgent work or you don't have capacity to bring in a new big client. So if it's more than 85, you probably want to look at hiring. If it's well below 70%, hiring a billable person is probably not the solution unless the thing what you're lacking is a specific skill that your existing team doesn't have yet. If you're hiring for a billable, if you're hiring for a billable role, your sales pipeline is absolutely critical to know. And that is something that you and your sales team or you and your marketing team should have a clear vision on. Um, as a rule of thumb, again, quite general, for a billable person, we would want to see, do you have the workload, the, the, the billable workload for that person lined up that three months from now, they can earn at least two times their salary costs in revenue. So three months after they are on board, because you have training and onboarding, et cetera, but three months after they are on board, can you bill their time for at least double their salary? If that's a no, then figure out how to solve that before you actually pull the gun and hire. If you're hiring for a non-billable role, so somebody in marketing or in uh, admin, there the biggest question is, how will this hire help you? And that will decide how much you can afford to pay. So some roles are simply, it must get done. And there you want to hire the right quality of person at the absolute lowest rate you can get. While others may probably free you up for much more higher uh, value added tasks. So it will either um, free you up. No, well, actually, no already covered that, but um, it should allow you to do more higher uh, value add stuff. So if you're hiring a marketeer, you probably don't want to be hiring the cheapest marketeer. You want to have the A player that actually delivers the value. And that's why starting with how much can you afford to pay is actually not the right question. It actually should start with what value is that person going to bring? And based on that value, you can decide how much you want to pay that person. And of course, that depends a bit on the role, how much you want that to be. So if we're talking about how much value will that person bring you, here too is the distinction between billable and non-billable. This is the easy part for the billable ones. It's simply their hourly rate times the amount of hour, uh, billable hours that they're going to make minus whatever they cost in salary and recruitment costs um, and training costs, et cetera. That is how much they will make you on a monthly basis. So that's the easy one. The harder one here is on the non-billable part because their value is much more indirect. Um, in the beginning, I mentioned one of our clients was too busy to send out invoices and too busy to send out proposals to their clients. It took him six months to finally realize I need to hire an executive assistant. So that EA, I don't know his or her salary, but he or she was worth it 10 times blindly because thanks to that person, the client could now sign the proposals, send out the invoices, send out proposals. Uh, and actually now they're working on their biggest client uh, so far for which he didn't have the time before that hire. So how to express the value that that person brings and how much you're willing to pay for that person? Honestly, that's not even the most uh, financial question of all. Um, the other one is if you're hiring somebody who is um, much better than you. And again, that's what Noel briefly touched on, but from the finance side, that counts as well. If you are hiring somebody who adds 10 times more value in a task than you do, if your cash flow allows it, but their salary, I wouldn't dare to say it doesn't matter, but it's not the most important factor. 
So as a general rule of thumb, the question is how much value will they deliver? And do you have the operational cash flow for the non-billable people to cover their salary? If those are yes, usually the salary is not the biggest bottleneck. The one thing that I want to point out here again is, uh, especially if we're talking about the salary not being the most critical one, is you got to hire the A players. Hiring a B or a C player, no matter what the salary is, is probably you're paying too much and you probably can't afford that. So then swing it back to you, Noel, how can you find that right A player? Yeah, no worries. So, and there's just been a question from Danny there. So let's just jump in on that for a sec. So Danny was saying now that we keep saying that if you're not profitable, you probably don't want to hire for billable roles. However, yeah. aren't billable roles revenue producing? Um, and my answer to that, Danny, so yes, absolutely. Billable roles are revenue producing, but the key question is, is kind of, it's the profitability side of things. So if you can bring someone in, that's going to shift you into profit, uh, or you're already in profit, then great. But the key thing being is, you know, making sure that they're not going to kind of uh, just add a further burden if there's other things that are stopping you being profitable. Yeah. So let me add a quick note on that. If the gross margin on that role is too low, just hiring more people is not going to solve that. And um, if, the, if the, 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 the efficiency of the team is too low, so they're only 50% billable, they may be profitable for the hours that they're billing, but if you don't have enough work to load them up, hiring wouldn't solve that. Cool, thanks Rob. So how can you find an A player? And crucially, how can you find an A player for your budget? Because you, you are, yeah, we're all constrained with budget to some extent. So while salaries are generally out of your control, okay, the, the, you know, the market commands what the market commands, there are some levers that you can pull to find really, really great people within the budget that you've got. So within the context of the role that you're looking to hire, the kind of, these are the kind of key points you need to think about. So first of all, you know, what level of person do you need to hire? You know, do you need a kind of a junior person that's just got a really great attitude um, because it's skills that kind of you can train them or they're SOPs and you can kind of get them going? Do you need a mid-level person, um, someone that's kind of going to manage things, work on their own initiative and really kind of drive things forward? Or do you need a really senior person that is maybe they're kind of going to drive strategy or really kind of own the function? So that's the first thing that you can decide. And that naturally has a significant effect in the, um, you know, in the kind of your ability to find an A player, you know, for your budget, it's going to have an effect. And the key word is need, right? Because we always think we want a really senior person, but actually really senior people are often not very good at really doing things. So it's really, really important to think about what do you actually need to be done? Going back to what I said at the start, you know, what are the actual jobs that, um, that kind of need to be done? And often what we find is that a really keen, great attitude holding mid-level person can be a much better fit than you know kind of a senior level person so that's one kind of thing to kind of uh, one kind of lever you can pull the kind of seniority that you're that you're looking at um then kind of part-time or full-time so there are huge amounts of people that are you know willing and looking and really keen on kind of part-time work whether that's because they've got other aspects of life or whether it's because they want you know extra money and they're doing it on top of a, another kind of full-time or part-time job really really do not estimate underestimate sorry what you can achieve from a part-time hire you can often get access to people that you simply couldn't attract to your business um full-time you know so as an example you know there's i've got clients that have hired kind of part-time consultants from the, the big big uh kind of worldwide kind of consulting firms that part-time are really keen and interested in working for a kind of a smaller agency um or a kind of smaller consulting firm that you would never attract some of these people kind of on a full-time basis because of the, you know, the life that they lead and the perks and benefits that they get, but you get access to their kind of their thoughts, their brain power, their shower thoughts, uh, as we often talk about. So that's, you know, it's a great way to start as well without committing a huge amount of money. Um, you can start more gently and kind of build them up potentially. So that you can kind of pull that lever as well to potentially start part-time uh, and build from there. And then finally, where you hire from makes a massive difference to the cost. You know, we're only interested in hiring A players. That's all we're ever interested in hiring. So where you hire from makes a huge difference to the cost. And you can kind of drop down to potentially kind of 40 or 50% of the cost of hiring in the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, kind of Western Europe by looking into other regions of the world. So places like kind of Latin America, 
uh, places like the Philippines. Naturally, with my focus, it, it's Eastern Europe. And you can find absolute um, incredible quality people, you know, the A players that we're all looking for, but at, you know, dramatically lower rates. And literally, typically, you know, if I take Eastern Europe as an example, we're typically hiring at about 40% of the kind of typical rate uh, that we see in the US. And crucially, we can actually find people. Whereas if you're really looking for an A player in the US or the UK right now, the jobs market is going crazy. And you, know, you just can't find the people, even if you had a limitless budget, it is really, really difficult. So they're kind of some of the levers that you can pull to help you find the A player that you want within the budget um, that you've got. Uh, but how much, I mean, you talk about the salaries levels, but how much does it actually cost to recruit? So I've got an answer you're gonna like, Rob, because uh, one answer is free. You can genuinely hire amazing people for free. And I talk to a lot of clients and sometimes I do myself out of some business doing this, but I tell people, you know, start with your existing team, ask them for the referrals, start with your network. But the best way to hire is through referrals. Really, really genuinely is. If, if ever you can, that's the way to start. Um, so, you know, how much does it cost to actually kind of recruit and hire someone? Well, you know, it can go from free uh, or almost free to you know many thousands of dollars and the variable generally is the quality of people you get and the amount of time that you have to spend in the hiring process so like i said you could ask your existing team for referrals and if they manage to refer someone in you might be able to jump them to a more advanced stage of the process but make sure not to skip the entire process you've still got to put them through a thorough kind of recruitment and interview and testing process but you know that could be very very low cost um you know, next up would be kind of going to job boards, whether it's uh, kind of remote first job boards, like kind of we work remotely or job rack or online jobs.ph, for instance, um, or whether it's, you know, the kind of monster.com, indeed.com, who, you know, the absolute massive kind of beasts of the, of the job board market. And the main thing that you must, must do is go to the right job board where the job seekers that you're after are actually hanging out. That's the, the really, really important thing. There's no point going to a job board that is focused on kind of marketing roles if you're looking for developers uh, or going to, you know, kind of just the wrong kind of place. You've got to be going to the right places for the right people. And, you know, job boards can, can run from, you know, 50 or $100 right up to kind of seven, $800 and more. Um, it's all about making sure that you're going to get the quality that you're looking for uh, and kind of finding the roles that you need. The main thing to kind of not Kind of miss kind of lose sight of i guess is although some of the job boards might just be a few hundred dollars to post your job ad the it's a do-it-yourself approach right the reason they're cheap is because you know you are doing all the work you're kind of reviewing all the candidates reviewing the cvs putting them through the various processes that you want to put them through you know you're kind of you know i won't say on your own but but not far off it right you've got to have the skills and the time and the energy to really kind of follow the uh, the recruitment process so that's something to bear in mind so few hundred dollars or more you know you can use a, a job board then there are the whole wealth of kind of hiring services out there from you know online kind of remote first uh, approaches to you know conventional recruiters who typically work on a kind of contingent basis and might charge you 20 or even 30 percent of the salary um, that's not something we find a lot of kind of online businesses working with generally because it, it tends to be pretty uh, unaffordable so that's where you know services that will do kind of done with you or done for you recruitment that will help you hire will help you find the A players and the best candidates. Um, and, you know, we'll kind of run the process for you and take a lot of the legwork and the hard effort away from you that typically is, you know, between kind of two and three or $4,000 um, to kind of help you through that process. And it's going to save you somewhere between about kind of 40 and 60 hours of your time. So depending how you value your time, that's a, a kind of a pretty good ROI generally. Um, so they're the kind of the range that we see. So from free, if you can get referrals, up to maybe kind of four or five thousand dollars at the at the high end if you're using a kind of fully kind of done for you done for you service. So I think you know we've covered a lot there, and I think the kind of the, the key thing to kind of finish up on, Rob, is you know yeah. what what difference will it make? Um, you know how do we know and how do we kind of establish what difference is it going to make to our business uh, once we've hired? Well. I think we can break it down in a couple of parts. One is the differences on your financials, uh, on your company's growth, and arguably on you and your life as the owner. On the financial side, in the short term, hiring somebody is going to cost you money. It's as simple as that. No matter what role you're hiring for, 
it's, I don't think I've ever seen anybody being uh, value added from day one. So that takes a bit of training, et cetera. So on the short term, financially, it will go down. But later, especially for the billable roles, or if you hire somebody to uh, invest in the future growth, that should be a very, very positive impact on your finances. If it's billable, it's a quite linear uh, role. The more work you put on their plate, the more margin you take. And if it's a good marketer or a good salesperson, it could be exponential growth. And so that's also the impact on the growth of your business and on your life. You basically, even as the owner, you're in the business of trading time for money in a way. Because if you put in more effort in the business, you're probably going to grow faster. So by hiring, uh, again, if it's the right person, the right budget, et cetera, you probably um, buy back part of your life. And to be honest, that's one of the things that I'm doing now. I have a seven month old son uh, here in the room, sleeping in the room behind me. We are hiring now to make sure that I have to spend less time on the growth of the business so that I have more time with him. And well, for me, that means that the value of that hire is almost infinite. Um, so I think that these are pretty much the key points to know like, how, if you can afford to hire. And um, it may surprise that they're less financial than some of you may have thought. And we have some time for a Q&A, but if you do want some more help with this, then we are both always happy to have it checked directly with you uh, to either go through the number side of the things or on the hiring side of things. And Noel just pasted the links for that in the chat. And just to be clear, that's not a high sales call. We, that's not our style. We grow and we learn and we add value by just having a chat and go through your questions and see if we can get you what you need or maybe we can refer you to somebody else who can. Um, that being said, let's go to the Q&A. Cool. I think we've got a couple of questions that people have um, submitted uh, whilst we've been um, whilst we've been talking, Rob. I'm just going to drop my screen up here. There we go. Um, so we had one question came in um, asking, kind of. So you've talked a lot about the kind of financial information, um, kind of that people should need uh, or kind of should have access to. And, and someone's here has just said, so who should give uh, me this financial information? Is this something that kind of the business owner should have? Should it be the accountant? Is it a bookkeeper? Um, you as the business owner should receive it. You definitely should not be the one doing it. If you have a good accountant or bookkeeper, he or she is the one who can give it to you. Uh, to be honest, I'm biased in this. I found most bookkeepers are unable to actually, they're good at making the books, but they're not good at translating it into what you need to see. Um, but the information, so if you are savvy at that yourself, you can do that. But the information needs to come from the bookkeeper or the accountant on your plate and ideally in a way that it's answering your questions in a way that it helps you rather than just plain a sheet of numbers. Cool, okay, cheers Rob. Um, and then, well, oh, there was also a question uh, about when, when should we hire for work that we're bidding on but we haven't got yet? Um, I think that's why actually for both of us. Hmm. Ideally, from my perspective, you don't want to commit to hiring somebody before you actually got the work secured. So if you sign the contract with the employee and then the client says, ah, sorry, we're going to go for the other company, you have a problem. So from my perspective, you want to sign the client first, but have the candidate lined up and confirm the candidate after you confirm the client. Yeah, and, and to add to that, Rob's absolutely right. The key thing, you know, the hiring does take time. You know, the, there's not many shortcuts to hiring. Uh, you can get help with it. You can potentially kind of have pre-screened candidates. The main thing you want is to have a hiring funnel. So if you are a, let's say you're a development agency, for instance, and so you're, you know, you're 
as you grow, you're going to need more developers. Ideally, you have a hiring funnel that you've kind of got people that have gone through the process. So you can start that process, you know, very, very early on. Even if you don't win the work, then it's kind of not the end of the world, right? You know, you've kind of interviewed some candidates. You may have paid some recruiting fees, but most kind of good recruitment firms that you'd work with are going to kind of hold that over for when you do need to hire. Um, and actually, if you're constantly bidding for work at some stage, they're going to come good and then you're going to need to bring those people in. And so, as Rob says, you know, you don't need to commit to actually hiring them until you've got the work. But you also don't want to be waiting the kind of four to six weeks plus notice period. Um, exactly. You know, you don't want to start that once you just uh, won the contract. And then um, we've got kind of one more question that's come in here. Is, um, is there a minimum number of hours to hire someone part time? Um, so I'll take that one. That's natural one for me. So the key thing for me is, you know, we, you know, we spend a lot of time talking and helping people hiring, you know, long term team members, people that are really kind of committed to, to you and your business. There is a point at which, you know, anything less than about five hours a week, it's just not very significant for them. Um, you know, you can have kind of committed kind of you can have freelancers that you kind of pick up and drop off and kind of work with now and again. That's absolutely fine. But for someone to be a team member that's really invested in your business, then for me, kind of about five hours a week is a minimum. Ideally, it's a little bit more. You know, once you start hitting kind of 10 hours a week plus, it starts being a bit more significant to them in terms of how much they're earning from you, um, how much they're committing to you, you know, engagement with you and your team, etc. So around about kind of five to 10 hours and upwards. Um, and you can do really, really well and you can get some really, really great work done, even at that, uh, you know, kind of relatively low entry point of, of number of hours. Again, it's about hiring the A players, the people that are cracking on, really getting things done, making kind of every minute of every hour really, really count. Let me add one quick thing there. I'm actually surprised with how low of a number of hours you would put there. Um, mm. from, the, from, the, from the efficiency of the staff, I understand. From the finance side, you have a hidden cost in having an employee in terms of not only recruiting the person, but also managing that person, engaging that person, et cetera. So if you have a whole range of people that are not doing that many hours, your overhead cost will be very high. So I would, from the finance side, would prefer to have slightly larger engagements, engagements than just five or eight hours a week. Yeah, and you, so yeah, you definitely don't want lots of people doing five or eight hours a week. Yeah. But if it's to start out in a particular role to then kind of build up over time, then then that's that's okay. Um, so we're just about out of time. Uh, like as Rob said earlier on, you know, we are both, uh, you know, we like to be helpful and friendly. We like to share a lot. Hence, us doing this session today. Uh, if you have other questions that you'd like us to answer in a future session, then please let us know. Uh, if you uh, would like to jump on, um, just for, as Rob said, it's no hard sell. Just if you want to have a chat about hiring, then click the link to book a call with me. If you want to chat about numbers, then jump on a, a kind of short call with Rob. Both of us just do kind of very friendly, very chilled out, short kind of 15 minute calls. Uh, so, yeah, if we can help in any way, please jump in, book a call and hope to speak to you uh, soon. Um, and aside from that, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, on this Wednesday afternoon and evening as it is here in, uh, in Europe. And uh, we hope to catch you again soon. Take care, everyone.